book seven part one of volume two part one of the memoirs of chateaubriand this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nicole lee the memoirs of chateaubriand by francois rene chateaubriand translated by alexander texera de matos volume two part one book seven part one i wrote to my brother in paris giving him particulars of my crossing telling him the reasons for my return and asking him to lend me the money wherewith to pay my passage my brother answered that he had forwarded my letter to my mother madame de chateaubriand did not keep me waiting she enabled me to clear my debt and to leave the isle she told me that lucile was with her also my uncle de bedet and his family this intelligence persuaded me to go to st malo so that i might consult my uncle on the question of my proposed emigration revolutions are like rivers they grow wider in their course i found that which i had left in france enormously swollen and overflowing its banks i had left it with mirabeau under the constituent i found it with danton under the legislative assembly the treaty of pilnitz of the twenty seventh of august seventeen ninety one had become known in paris on the fourteenth of december seventeen ninety one while i was being tossed by the storms the king announced that he had written to the princes of the germanic body and in particular to the elector of treves touching the german armaments the brothers of louis the sixteenth the prince de conde m de calonne the vicomte de mirabeau and m de laqueville were almost immediately impeached as early as the ninth of november a previous decree had been hurled against the other emigrants it was to enter these ranks already prescribed that i was hastening others might perhaps have retreated but the threats of the stronger have always made me take the side of the weaker the pride of victory is unendurable to me on my way from the arve to st malo i was able to observe the divisions and misfortunes of france the country seats were burnt and abandoned the owners to whom distaffs had been sent had left the women were living sheltered in the towns the hamlets and small market towns groaned under the tyranny of clubs affiliated to the central club des cordeliers since amalgamated with the jacobins the antagonist of the latter the societe monarchique or des fuyons no longer existed the vulgar nickname of sans culotte had become popular the king was never spoken of save as m vito or m capet i was tenderly welcomed by my mother and my family although they deplored the inopportune moment which i had selected for my return my uncle the comte de Bede, was preparing to go to jersey with his wife his son and his daughters it was a question of finding money to enable me to join the princess my american journey had made a breach in my fortune my property was reduced to almost nothing where my younger son's portion was concerned through the suppression of the feudal rights and the benefices that were to accrue to me by virtue of my affiliation to the order of malta had fallen with the remainder of the goods of the clergy into the hands of the nation the conjuncture of circumstances decided the most serious step in my life my family married me in order to procure me the means of going to get killed in support of a cause which i did not love there was living in retirement at st malo monsieur de la vigne a knight of st louis and formerly commandant of l'orient the comte d'artois had stayed with him there when he visited brittany the prince was charmed with his host and promised to grant him any favour he might at any time demand m de lavigne had two sons one of them married mademoiselle de la placeliere two daughters born of this marriage were left orphans on both sides at a tender age the elder married the comte du plessis pasco a captain in the navy the son and grandson of admirals himself to-day a re-admiral a red ribbon and commander of the corps of naval cadets at brest the younger was living with her grandfather and was seventeen years of age when i arrived at st malo on my return from america she was white delicate slender and very pretty she wore her beautiful fair hair which curled naturally hanging low like a child's her fortune was valued at five or six hundred thousand francs my sisters took it into their heads to make me marry mademoiselle de la vigne who had become greatly attached to lucile the affair was managed without my knowledge i had seen mademoiselle de la vigne three or four times at most i recognised her at a distance on the furrow by her pink pelisse her white gown and her fair hair blown out by the wind when i was on the beach abandoning myself to the caresses of my old mistress the sea i felt myself to possess none of the good qualities of a husband all my illusions were alive nothing was spent within me the very energy of my existence had doubled through my travels i was racked by the muse lucile liked mademoiselle de la vigne and saw the independence of my fortune in this marriage have your way said i in me the public man is inflexible the private man is at the mercy of whomsoever wishes to seize hold of him and to save myself an hour's wrangling i would become a slave for a century the consent of the grandfather the paternal uncle and the principal relatives was easily obtained there remained to be overcome the objections of a maternal uncle m de vauvert 
a great democrat who opposed the marriage of his niece with an aristocrat like myself who was not one at all we thought ourselves able to do without him but my pious mother insisted that the religious marriage should be performed by a non-juror priest which could only be done in secret m de vauvain knew this and let loose the law upon us under pretext of rape and breach of the laws and pleading the imaginary state of second childhood into which the grandfather m de lavigne had fallen mademoiselle de lavigne who had become madame de chateaubriand without my having held any communication with her was taken away in the name of the law and put into the convent of victory at st malo pending the decision of the courts there was no rape breach of the laws adventure nor love in the whole matter the wedding had only the bad side of a novel truth the case was tried and the court pronounced the marriage civilly valid the members of both families being in agreement m de vauvert abandoned the proceedings the constitutional clergyman lavishly feed withdrew his protest against the first nuptial benediction and madame de chateaubriand was released from the convent where lucile had imprisoned herself with her it was a new acquaintance that i had to make and it brought me all that i could wish i doubt whether a finer intelligence than my wife's has ever existed she guesses the thought and the word about to spring to the brow or the lips of the person with whom she converses to deceive her is impossible madame de chateaubriand has an original and cultured mind writes most cleverly tells the story to perfection and admires me without ever having read two lines of my works she would dread to find ideas in them that differ from hers or to discover that people are not sufficiently enthusiastic over my merit although a passionate judge she is well informed and a good judge madame de chateaubriand's defects if she have any proceed from the superabundance of her good qualities my own very serious defects result from the sterility of mine it is easy to possess resignation patience a general obligingness equanimity of temper when one interests himself in nothing when one is wearied by everything when one replies to good and bad fortune alike with a desperate and despairing what does it matter madame de chateaubriand is better than i although less accessible in her intercourse with others have i been irreproachable in my relations with her have i offered my companion all the sentiments which she deserved and which were hers by right has she ever complained what happiness has she tasted in reward for her consistent affection she has shared my adversities she has been plunged into the prisons of the terror the persecutions of the empire the disgraces of the restoration she has not known the joys of maternity to counterbalance her sufferings deprived of children which she might perhaps have had in another union and which she would have loved madly having none of the honours and affections which surround the mother of a family and console a woman for the loss of her prime she has travelled sterile and solitary towards old age often separated from me disliking literature to her the pride of bearing my name makes no amends timid and trembling for me alone she is deprived through her ever-renewed anxiety of sleep and of the time to cure her ills i am her chronic infirmity and the cause of her relapses can i compare an occasional impatience which she has shown me with the cares which i have caused her can i set my good qualities such as they are against her virtues which support the poor which have established the infirmary de marie therese in the face of all obstacles what are my labours beside the works of that christian woman when the two of us appear before god it is i who shall be condemned upon the whole when i consider my nature with all its imperfections is it certain that marriage has spoilt my destiny i should no doubt have had more leisure and repose i should have been better received in certain circles than by certain of the great ones of this earth yet in politics though madame de chateaubriand may have crossed me she never checked me for here as in matters affecting my honour i judge only by my own feeling should i have produced a greater number of works if i had remained independent and would those works have been any better have there not been circumstances as shall be seen in which by marrying outside france i should have ceased to write and disown my country if i had not married would not my weakness have made me the prey of some worthless creature should not i have squandered and polluted my days like lord byron to-day when i am sinking into old age all my wildness would have passed nothing would remain to me but emptiness and regrets i should be an old bachelor unesteemed either deceived or undeceived an old bird repeating my worn-out song to whosoever refused to listen to it the full indulgence of my desires would not have added one string more to my lyre nor one more earnest note to my voice the constraint of my feelings the mystery of my thoughts have perhaps increased the forcefulness of my accents quickened my works with an internal fever with a hidden flame which would have spent itself in the free air of love held back by an indissoluble tie i purchased at first at the cost of a little bitterness the sweets which i taste to-day of the ills of my existence i preserved only the incurable part i therefore owe an affectionate and eternal gratitude to my wife whose attachment has been as touching as it has been profound and sincere she has rendered my life more grave more noble more honourable by always inspiring me with respect for duty if not always with the strength to perform it 
I was married at the end of March 1792, and on the 20th of April the Legislative Assembly declared war against Francis II, who had just succeeded his father Leopold. On the 10th of the same month, Benedict Lave was beatified in Rome, and there you have two different worlds. The war hurried the remaining nobles out of France. Persecutions were being redoubled on the one hand. On the other, the royalists were no longer permitted to stay at home, without being accounted as cowards. It was time for me to make my way to the camp which I had come so far to seek. My uncle de Bedé and his family took ship for Jersey, and I set out for Paris with my wife and my sisters Lucille and Julie. We had secured an apartment in the little Hôtel de Villette in the cul-de-sac Ferroux, Faubourg Saint-Germain. I hastened in search of my first friends. I saw the men of letters with whom I had had some acquaintance. Among new faces I noticed those of the learned Abbé Barthélemy and the poet Saint-Ange. The abbe modelled the gynecea of Athens too closely upon the drawing-rooms at Chanteloup. The translator of Ovid was not a man without talent. Talent is a gift, an isolated thing. It can come together with other mental faculties, it can be separated from them. saint Ange supplied a proof of this. He made the greatest efforts not to be stupid, but was unable to prevent himself. A man whose pencil I admired and still admire, Bernardin de Saint-Pierre, was lacking in intelligence and unfortunately his character was on a level with his intelligence how many pictures in the Etude de la nature are spoilt by the writer's limited mind and want of elevation of soul Rullier had died suddenly in seventeen ninety one before my departure for america i have seen since his little house at st denis with the fountain and the pretty statue of love at the foot of which one reads these verses d'egmont avec l'amour visita cette rive une image de sa beauté se peignit un moment sur l'onde fugitive d'egmont a disparu la morcelle est restée when i left france the theatres of paris were still ringing with the reveil de pimenide and with this stanza j'aime la vertu guerrière de nos braves défenseurs mais d'un peuple sanguinaire je déteste les fureurs à l'europe redoutable soyons libres à jamais mais soyons toujours aimables et gardons l'esprit français when i returned the reveil de pimenide had been forgotten and if the stanza had been sung the author would have been badly handled Charles the Ninth was now the rage. The popularity of this piece depended principally upon the circumstances of the time. The toxin, a nation armed with poniards, the hatred of the kings and the priests, all these offered a reproduction between four walls of the tragedy which was being publicly enacted. Talma, still at the commencement of his career, was continuing his successes. While tragedy dyed the streets, the pastoral flourished on the stage. There is question of little but innocent shepherds and virginal shepherdesses fields brooks meadows sheep doves the golden age beneath the thatch were revived to the sighing of the shepherd's pipe before the cooing terces and the simple-minded knitting women who had but lately left that other spectacle of the guillotine had sanson had time he would have played colin to mademoiselle tiroin de mericourt's babette the conventionals plumed themselves upon being the mildest of men good fathers good sons good husbands they went out walking with the children acted as their nurses wept with tenderness at their simple games they lifted these little lambs gently in their arms to show them the gg's of the carts carrying the victims to execution they sang the praises of nature peace pity kindness candour the domestic virtues these devout philanthropists with extreme sensibility sent their neighbours to have their heads sliced off for the greater happiness of mankind paris in seventeen ninety two no longer presented the outward aspect of seventeen eighty nine and seventeen ninety one saw no longer the budding revolution but a people marching drunk to its destinies across abysses and by uncertain roads the appearance of the people was no longer tumultuous curious eager it was threatening in the streets one met none but frightened or ferocious figures men creeping along the houses so as not to be seen or others seeking their prey timid and lowered eyes were turned away from you or else harsh eyes were fixed on yours in order to sound and fathom you all diversity of costume had ceased the old world kept in the background men had donned the uniform cloak of the new world a cloak which had become merely the last garment of the future victims already the social license displayed at the rejuvenation of france the liberties of seventeen eighty nine those fantastic and unruly liberties of a state of things which is engaged in self-destruction and which has not yet turned to anarchy were levelling themselves beneath the sceptre of the people one felt the approach of a plebeian tyranny fruitful it is true and filled with expectations but also formidable in a manner very different from the decaying despotism of the old monarchy for the sovereign people being ubiquitous when it turns tyrant the tyrant is ubiquitous it is the universal presence of an universal tiberius with the parisian population was mingled an exotic population of cutthroats from the south the advance guard of the marseilles whom danton was bringing up for the day's work of the tenth of august and the massacres of september 
were recognisable by their rags their bronze complexions their look of cowardice and crime but of crime of another son in vultu vitium in the legislative assembly there was no one whom i recognised mirabeau and the early idols of our troubles either were no more or had been hurled from their altars in order to put together the thread of history broken by my journey in america i must trace matters a little further back the flight of the king on the twenty first of june seventeen ninety one caused the revolution to take an immense step forward brought back to paris on the twenty fifth of that month he was then dethroned for the first time since the national assembly declared that its decrees would have the force of law without there being any need of royal sanction or acceptance a high court of justice anticipating the revolutionary tribunal was established at orleans thenceforward madame roland demanded the head of the queen until such time as her own head should be demanded by the revolution the mob gathering had taken place in the champ de mars to protest against the decree which suspended the king from his functions instead of putting him upon his trial the acceptance of the constitution on the fourteenth of september had no calming effect there was a question of declaring the dethronement of louis the sixteenth had this been done the crime of the twenty first of january would not have been committed the position of the french people in relation to the monarchy and in the eyes of posterity would have been different the constituents who opposed the dethronement thought they were saving the crown whereas they undid it those who thought to undo it by demanding the dethronement would have saved it in politics the result is almost invariably the opposite of what is foreseen on the thirtieth of that same month of september seventeen ninety one the constituent assembly held its last sitting the imprudent decree of the seventeenth of may previous which prohibited the re-election of the retiring members gave birth to the convention there is nothing more dangerous more inadequate more inapplicable to general affairs than resolutions appropriate to individuals or bodies of men however honourable in themselves the decree of the twenty ninth of september for regulating popular societies served only to make them more violent this was the last act of the constituent assembly it dissolved on the following day bequeathing to france a revolution the legislative assembly installed on the first of october seventeen ninety one revolved within the whirlwind which was about to sweep away the living and the dead troubles stained the departments with blood at caen the people were surfeited with massacres and ate the heart of m de Belsens. The king set his veto to the decree against the emigrants, and to that which deprived the non jura ecclesiastics of all emolument. These lawful acts increased the excitement. Pétion had become mayor of Paris. The deputies preferred a bill of impeachment against the emigrant princes on the 1st of January, 1792. On the 2nd, they fixed the commencement of the year 4 of liberty on that same 1st of January. About the 13th of February, red caps were seen in the streets of Paris, and the municipality ordered pikes to be manufactured the manifesto of the emigrants appeared on the first of march austria armed paris was divided into more or less hostile sections on the twentieth of march seventeen ninety two the legislative assembly adopted the sepulchral piece of mechanism without which the sentences of the terror could not have been executed it was first tried on dead bodies so that these might teach it its trade one may speak of the instrument as of an executioner since persons who were touched by its good services presented it with sums of money for its support the invention of the murder machine at the very moment when it had become necessary to crime is a noteworthy proof of the intelligence of coordinate facts or rather a proof of the hidden action of providence when it proposes to change the face of empires minister roland had been summoned to the king's council at the instigation of the girondins on the twentieth of april war was declared against the king of hungary and bohemia marat published the ami du peuple in spite of the decree by which he was stricken the royal german regiment and the berchini regiment deserted isnard spoke of the perfidy of the court Gensonnet and brissot denounced the austrian committee an insurrection broke out on the subject of the royal guard which was disbanded on the twenty eighth of may the assembly declared its sittings permanent on the twentieth of june the palace of the tuileries was forced by the mob of the faubourg saint antoine and saint marceau the pretext being the refusal of louis the sixteenth to sanction the prescription of the priests the king was in peril of his life the country was declared in danger m de lafayette was burnt in effigy the federates of the second federation were arriving the marseillais called up by danton were on the march they entered paris on the thirtieth of july and were billeted by petion at the cordelier by the side of the national tribune two competing tribunes had sprung up that of the jacobins and that of the cordelier then the more formidable because it sent members to the famous commune of paris and supplied it with means of action if the formation of the commune had not taken place paris for want of a point of concentration would have split up and the various mayoralties become rival powers the club des cordeliers had its abode in the monastery whose church was built in the reign of st louis in twelve fifty nine 
with funds paid as damages for a murder. In 1590 it became the resort of the most famous leaguers. Certain places seemed to be the laboratories of factions. Intelligence was brought, says Le Toile, 12th July 1593, to the Duc de Mayenne, of two hundred Cordeliers newly arrived in Paris, supplying themselves with arms and concerting with the sixteen who held council daily at the Cordelier of Paris. On that day the sixteen, assembled at the Cordelier, cast aside their arms. The fanatics of the League had therefore handed down the monastery of the Cordelier to our philosophical revolutionaries as a dead house. The pictures, the carved and painted images, the veils, the curtains of the convent had been pulled down. The basilica, flayed of its skin, presented its spare skeleton to the eye. In the apsis of the church, where the wind and the rain entered through the broken panes of the rose windows, some joiner's benches served as a table for the president, when the sittings were held in the church. On these benches lay red caps, with which each speaker covered his head before ascending the tribune. The latter consisted of four buttressed stop planks, crossed at their ex by a single plank, like a scaffolding. Behind the president, together with the Statue of Liberty, one saw so-called instruments of ancient justice, instruments whose place had been supplied by one other, the blood machine, in the same way as complicated machinery has been replaced by the hydraulic ram. The Club des Jacobins Epuré, or Purge Jacobin Club, borrowed some of these arrangements of the Cordelier. The orators, who had met for purposes of destruction, were unable to agree in electing their leaders, or in the methods to be employed. They treated each other as scoundrels, pickpockets, thieves, butchers, to the cacophony of the hisses and groans of their several groups of devils. Their metaphors were taken from the stock of murders, borrowed from the filthiest objects of every kind of sewer and dunghill, or drawn from the places consecrated to the prostitution of men and women. Gestures accentuated these figures of speech. Everything was called by its name with cynical indecency, in an obscene and impious pageantry of oaths and blasphemies. Destruction and production, death and generation, one distinguished naught else through this savage slang which deafened the ears. The speech-makers, with their shrill or thundering voices, had interrupters other than their opponents. The little brown owls of the cloisters without monks, and the steeple without bells, played in the broken windows, in the hope of booty. They interrupted the speeches. They were first called to order by the jingling of the impotent bell, but when they failed to stop their clamour, shots were fired at them, to compel them to silence. They fell, throbbing, wounded, and fatidical, in the midst of the pandemonium, broken down timber-work, rickety pews, ramshackle stalls, fragments of saints rolled and pushed against the walls, served as benches for the dirty, grimy, drunken, sweating spectators, in their ragged carmagnols, with their shouldered pikes or bare crossed arms. The most deformed of the band obtained the readiest hearing. Mental and bodily infirmities have played a part in our troubles. Wounded self-love has made great revolutionaries. Following this precedence of hideousness, there appeared in succession, mingled with the ghosts of the sixteen, a series of gorgon heads, the former doctor of the conduct to our bodyguards, the Swiss fetus Mara, his bare feet in wooden clogs or hobnail shoes, was the first to hold forth by virtue of his incontestable claims. Holding the office of jester at the court of the people, he exclaimed with an insipid expression and the smirk of trite politeness which the old bringing up set on every face, People, you must cut off two hundred and seventy thousand heads. To this Caligula of the public places succeeded the atheistical shoemaker Chemet. He is followed by the attorney-general to the lantern, Camille Desmoulins, a stuttering Cicero, a public counsellor of murders, worn out with debauchery, a frivolous republican with his puns and jokes, a maker of graveyard jests, who said that, in the massacres of September, all had passed off orderly. He consented to become a Spartan, provided the making of the black broth was left to Mayo, the tavern-keeper. Fouché, who had hastened up from Juilly or Nantes, studied disaster under those doctors. In the circle of wild beasts seated attentively round the chair, he looked like a dressed-up hyena. He smelt the effluvium of the blood to come. Already he inhaled the incense of the procession of asses and executioners, pending the day on which, driven from the Club des Jacobins as a thief, an atheist and an assassin, he should be chosen as a minister. When Mara had climbed down from his plank, that popular tribulé became the sport of his masters. They filliped him on the nose, trod on his feet, hustled him with gee-ups, all of which did not prevent him from becoming the leader of the multitude, climbing to the clock of the Hôtel de Ville, sounding the tocsin for a general massacre, and triumphing in the revolutionary tribunal. Mara, like Milton's sin, was violated by death. Chenier wrote his apotheosis. David painted him in his blood-stained bath. He was compared to the divine author of the gospel. A prayer was dedicated to him. Heart of Jesus, heart of Mara. O sacred heart of Jesus, O sacred heart of Mara. This heart of Mara had for a ciborium a costly pyx from the royal repository. In a grass-grown cenotaph, erected on the plastic carousel, 
who exhibited the divinity's bust his bath lamp and inkstand then the wind changed the unclean thing poured from its agate urn into a different vase was emptied into the sewer the scene at the cordelier of which i witnessed some three or four were dominated and presided over by danton a hun of gothic stature with a flat nose outspread nostrils furrowed jaws and the face of a gendarme combined with that of a lewd and cruel attorney in the shell of his church as it were the skeleton of the centuries danton with his three male furies camille desmoulins marat and frappe d'eglantine organized the assassinations of september the eau de varenne proposed to set fire to the prisons and burn all those inside another conventional voted that all the untried prisoners should be drowned marat declared himself in favour of a general massacre danton was besought to show mercy to the prisoners the prisoners he replied as author of the circular of the commune he invited free men to repeat in the departments the enormities perpetrated at the carmelites and the abbe let us consider history sixtus v pronounced the devotion of jacques clement to be equal for the salvation of mankind to the mystery of the incarnation even as mara was compared to the saviour of the world charles the ninth wrote to the governors of provinces to imitate the st bartholomew massacres even as danton summoned the patriots to copy the massacres of september the jacobins were plagiaries and they were still more so when they offered up louis the sixteenth in imitation of charles the first as these crimes were connected with the great social movement some have very unaptly imagined that those crimes produced the greatness of the revolution of which they were but the hideous pasticcios while watching a fine nature suffering passionate or systematic minds have admired only its convulsions danton more candid than the english said we will not try our king we will kill him he also said those priests and nobles are not guilty but they must die because they are out of place they trammel the movement of things and obstruct the future these words beneath an appearance of horrible depth possess no extent of genius for they presume that innocence is nothing and that moral order can be withdrawn from political order without causing the latter to perish which is false danton had not the conviction of the principles he maintained he had donned the revolutionary cloak only to make his fortune come and brawl with us he advised a young man when you have grown rich you can do as you please he admitted that if he had not sold himself to the court it was because it would not pay a high enough price for him an instance of the effrontery of a mind that knows itself and a corruption that reveals itself open-mouthed though inferior even in ugliness to marat whose agent he had been danton was superior to robespierre without like the latter having given his name to his crimes he preserved the religious sense we have not he said destroyed superstition to establish atheism his passions might have been good ones if only because they were passions we must allow for character in the actions of men culprits with heated imaginations like danton seem by reason of the very exaggeration of their sayings and doings to be more froward than the cool-headed culprits whereas in fact they are less so this remark applies also to the people taken collectively the people is a poet author and ardent actor of the piece which it plays or is made to play its excesses partake not so much of the instinct of a native cruelty as of the delirium of a crowd intoxicated with sights especially when these are tragic a thing so true that in popular horrors there is always something superfluous added to the picture and the emotion danton was caught in the trap himself had laid it availed him nothing to flick pellets of bread at his judges noses to reply nobly and courageously to cause the tribunal to hesitate to endanger and terrify the convention to reason logically upon crimes by which the very power of his enemies had been created to exclaim smitten with barren repentance it was i who instituted this infamous tribunal i crave pardon for it of god and men a phrase which has been pilfered more than once it was before being indicted before the tribunal that he should have declared its infamy it only remained to danton to show himself as pitiless for his own death as he had been for that of his victims to hold his head higher than the hanging knife and this he did from the state of the terror where his feet stuck in the clotted blood of the previous day after turning a glance of contempt and domination over the crowd he said to the headsman show my head to the people it is worth showing danton's head remained in the executioner's hands while the acephalous shade went to join the decapitated shades of his victims a further instance of equality danton's deacon and subdeacon camille desmoulins and frappe d'eglantine died in the same manner as their priest at a time when pensions were being paid to the guillotine when one wore at the buttonhole of one's carmagnole by way of a flower a little guillotine in gold or else a small piece of a guillotine person's heart at a time when people shouted hell for ever when they celebrated the joyful orgies of blood steel and fury when they toasted annihilation when they danced the dance of the dead quite naked so as not to have the trouble of undressing when about to join them at that time one was bound in the end to come to the last banquet the last pleasantry of sorrow 
Desmoulins was invited to Fouquier Tanville's tribunal. What is your age? asked the president. The age of the saint culotte Jesus, replied Camille facetiously. An avenging obsession compelled the assassins of Christians unceasingly to confess the name of Christ. It would be unfair to forget that Camille Desmoulins dared to defy Robespierre and to atone for his errors by his courage. He gave the signal for the reaction against the terror. A young and charming wife, full of energy, had, by making him capable of love, made him capable of virtue and sacrifice. Indignation instilled eloquence into the tribune's coarse and reckless irony. He attacked in the grand manner the scaffolds he had helped to erect. Adapting his conduct to his speech, he refused to consent to his execution. He struggled with the headsman in the tumbrel, and arrived at the edge of the last gulf with his clothes half torn from his back. Fab de Glantine, author of a play which shall live, displayed, quite contrary to Desmoulins, a signal weakness. Jean Rousseau, public executioner of Paris under the League, who was hanged for lending his officers to the assassins of the President Brisson, could not bring himself to accept the rope. It seems that one does not learn how to die by killing others. The debates at the Cordelier established for me the fact of a state of society at the most rapid moment of its transformation. I had seen the Constituent Assembly commence the murder of the kingship in 1789 and 1790. I found the bodies still quite warm of the old monarchy handed over in 1792 to the legislative gut-workers. They disembowelled and dissected it in the cellars of their clubs, as the Holbediers cut up and burnt the body of the Balafre in the garret of Blois Castle. Of all the men whom I recall, Danton, Marat, Camille Desmoulins, Fab d'Eglantine, Robespierre, not one is alive. I met them for a moment on my passage between a nascent society in America and an expiring society in Europe, between the forests of the New World and the solitudes of exile. Before I had reckoned a few months on foreign soil, those lovers of death had already spent themselves in her arms. At the distance at which I now find myself from their appearance, it seems to me as though, after descending into the infernal regions of my youth, I retain a confused recollection of the shades which I vaguely saw wander by the bank of Cossetus. They complete the varied dreams of my life, and come to be inscribed on my tablets of beyond the tomb. It was a great pleasure to meet M. de Malzerbe again, and speak to him of my old projects. I stated my plans for a second journey, which was to last nine years. All I had to do first was to take another little journey to Germany. I was to run to the army of the princes, and come back at a run to kill the revolution. All this would be finished in two or three months, when I should hoist my sail and return to the new world, having got rid of a revolution, and enriched myself by a marriage and yet my zeal exceeded my faith. I felt that the emigration was a stupidity and a madness. I was shaven on all hands, says Montaigne. To the Ghibelin I was a Guelph, to Guelph a Ghibelin. My distaste for absolute monarchy left me with no illusions concerning the step I was taking. I cherished scruples, and although resolved to sacrifice myself to honour, I desired to have M. de Malzerbe's opinion on the emigration. I found him much incensed. The crimes continued under his eyes had caused the friend of Rousseau to lose his political toleration between the cause of the victims and that of the butchers he did not hesitate he believed that anything was better than the existing state of things he thought that in my particular case a man wearing the sword was bound to join the brothers of a king who was oppressed and delivered to his enemies he approved of my returning to america and urged my brother to go with me i raised the ordinary objections based upon the assistance of foreigners the interests of the country and so on he replied and passing from general arguments to details quoted some awkward examples he put before me the case of the Guelphs and Ghibelins, relying on the troops of the Emperor and the Pope, in England the barons rising against John Lackland. Finally, in our times, he quoted the case of the Republic of the United States, imploring the assistance of France. In the same way, continued M. de Malzerbe, the men most devoted to liberty and philosophy, the Republicans and Protestants, have never considered themselves to blame when they have borrowed a force which could ensure the victory of their opinion. Would the new world be free to-day without our gold, our ships, and our soldiers? I, Malzerbe, who am speaking to you, did not I, in 1776, receive Franklin, who came to renew the relations entered into by Silas Dean, and yet, was Franklin a traitor? Was American liberty any the less honourable for being assisted by Lafayette, and won by French grenadiers? Every government which, instead of securing the fundamental laws of society, itself transgresses the laws of equity, rules of justice, ceases to exist and restores man to the state of nature. It is then lawful to defend oneself as best one may, to resort to the means that appear most calculated to overthrow tyranny and to restore the rights of one and all. The principles of natural right as set forth by the greatest publicists, developed by such a man as M. de Malzerbe, and supported by numerous historical examples, struck me without convincing me. 
i yielded in reality only to the impulse of my age to the point of honour i will add some more recent examples to those of m de malesherbes during the spanish war of eighteen twenty three the french republican party went to serve under the banner of the cortes and did not scruple to bear arms against its own country in eighteen thirty and eighteen thirty one the poles and the constitutional italians invoked the assistance of france and the portuguese of the charter invaded their country with the aid of foreign money and foreign soldiers we have two standards of weight and measurement we approve in the case of one idea one system one interest one man of that which we condemn in the case of another idea another system another interest another man these conversations between myself and the illustrious defender of the king took place at my sister-in-law's she had just given birth to a second son to whom m de malesherbes stood godfather and gave his name christian i was present at the baptism of this child which was to see its father and mother only at an age at which life leaves no memory and appears at a distance like an ill-remembered dream the preparations for my departure lagged they had thought that they were making me contract a rich marriage it appeared that my wife's fortune was invested in church securities the nation undertook to pay them after its own fashion not only that but madame de chateaubriand had with the consent of her trustees lent the scrip of a large portion of these securities to her sister the comtesse du plessis pasco who had emigrated money was still wanting therefore it became necessary to borrow a notary procured ten thousand francs for us i was taking them home to the cul-de-sac ferru in assignats when in the rue de richelieu i met one of my old messmates in the navarre regiment the comte hachard he was a great gambler he proposed that we should go to the rooms of m where we could talk the devil urged me i went upstairs i played i lost all except fifteen hundred francs with which full of remorse and humiliation i climbed into the first coach that passed i had never played before play produced in me a sort of painful intoxication if the passion had attacked me it would have turned my brain with half disordered wits i stepped out of the coach at saint sulpice and left my pocket-book behind containing the remnant of my treasure i ran home and said that i had left the ten thousand francs in a hackney coach i went out again turned down the rue dauphine crossed the pont neuf feeling half inclined to throw myself into the water i went to the place du palais royal where i had taken the ill-omened vehicle i questioned the savoyards who watered the screws and described my conveyance they told me a number at random the police commissary of the district informed me that that number belonged to a job-master living at the top of the faubourg saint denis i went to the man's house i remained all night in the stable waiting for the hackney coaches to return a large number arrived in succession which were not mine at last at two o'clock in the morning i saw my chariot drive in i had hardly time to recognise my two white steeds when the poor beasts utterly worn out dropped down upon the straw stiff their stomachs distended their legs stretched out as though dead the coachman remembered driving me after me he had taken up a citizen whom he had set down at the jacobins after the citizen a lady whom he had taken to the, the rue de clery number thirteen after that lady a gentleman whom he had put down at the recollects in the rue saint martin i promised the driver a gratuity and the moment daylight had come set out on the discovery of my fifteen hundred francs as i had gone in search of the north-west passage it seemed clear to me that the citizen of the jacobins had confiscated them by right of his sovereignty the young person of the rue de clery averred that she had seen nothing in the coach i reached the third station without any hope the coachman gave a tolerably good description of the gentleman he had driven the porter exclaimed it's the pair so-and-so he led me through the passages and the deserted apartments to a recollect who had remained behind alone to make an inventory of the furniture of his convent seated on a heap of rubbish in a dusty frock-coat the monk listened to my story are you he asked the chevalier de chateaubriand yes i replied here's your pocket-book said he i would have brought it when i had finished i found your address inside it was this hunted and plundered monk engaged in conscientiously counting up the relics of his cloister for his proscribes who restored to me the fifteen hundred francs with which i was about to make my way to exile failing the small sum i should not have emigrated what should i have become my whole life would have changed i will be hanged if i would to-day move a step to recover a million this happened on the sixteenth of june seventeen ninety two obeying the promptings of my instinct i had returned from america to offer my sword to louis sixteenth not to associate myself with party intrigues the disbanding of the king's new guard of which murat was a member the successive ministries of roland du Maurier, du port du tertre the little conspiracies of the court and the great popular risings filled me only with weariness and contempt i heard much talk of madame roland whom i never saw her memoirs showed that she possessed an extraordinary strength of mind she was said to be very agreeable it remains to be known whether she was sufficiently so to make at all tolerable the cynicism of her unnatural virtues certainly the woman who at the foot of the guillotine asked for pen and ink to describe the last moments of her journey 
to write down the discoveries she had made in the course of her progress from the conciergerie to the place de la revolution that woman displayed an absorption in futurity a contempt for life of which there are few examples madame roland possessed character rather than genius the first can give the second the second cannot give the first on the nineteenth of june i went to the vale of montmorency to visit the hermitage of j j rousseau not that i delighted in the memories of madame d'epinay and of that depraved and artificial society but i wished to take leave of the solitude of a man whose morals were antipathetic to mine although he himself was endowed with a talent whose accents stirred my youth on the next day the twentieth of june i was still at the hermitage and there met two men walking like myself in that deserted spot during the fatal day of the monarchy indifferent as they were or might be thought i to the affairs of this world one was m mariette of the empire the other m barret of the republic the amiable barret had come far from the uproar in his sentimental philosophical way to whisper soft revolutionary nothings to the shade of julie the troubadour of the guillotine on whose report the convention decreed that the terror was the order of the day escaped the same terror by hiding in the head-basket from the bottom of the bloody trough beneath the scaffold he was heard only to croak the word death Barre belonged to the species of tigers which Oppian represents as born of the wind's light breath, Velosa's a fiery proles. Ganganet, Chamfort, my old friends among the men of letters, were delighted with the 20th of June. Larp, continuing his lectures at the Lycée, shouted in a stentorian voice, Fools! To all the representations of the people you answered, Bayonets, bayonets? Well, you have them now, your bayonets although my travels in america had made a less insignificant personage of me i was unable to rise to so great a height of principle and eloquence fontaine was in danger through his former connection with the société monarchique my brother was a member of a club of enragés the prussians were marching by virtue of a convention between the cabinets of vienna and berlin a rather fierce engagement had already taken place between the french and austrians near mont it was more than time for me to take a decision my brother and i procured false passports for lille we were two wine merchants and national guards of paris wearing the uniform and proposing to tender for the army supplies my brother's valet louis poulain known as saint louis travelled under his own name he came from lamballe in lower brittany but was going to see his family in flanders the day of our emigration was settled for the fifteenth of july the day after the second federation we spent the fourteenth in the tivoli garden with the rosambo family my sisters and my wife tivoli belonged to m boutin whose daughter had married m de Malesherbes towards the end of the day we saw a good many federates wandering about after disbanding on their hats was written in chalk pétion or death tivoli the starting point of my exile was to become a centre of amusements and fetes our relations took leave of us without sadness they were persuaded that we were going on a pleasure trip my recovered fifteen hundred francs seemed a treasure sufficient to bring me back in triumph to paris on the tenth of july at six o'clock in the morning we climbed into the diligence we had booked our seats in the front part by the guard the valet whom we were supposed not to know stuffed himself into the inside with the other passengers st louis walked in his sleep in paris he used to go looking for his master at night with his eyes open but quite asleep he used to undress my brother and put him to bed sleeping all the time answering i know i know to all that was said to him during his attacks and waking only when cold water was thrown in his face he was a man of about forty nearly six feet high and as ugly as he was tall this poor fellow who was very respectful by nature had never served any master except my brother he was quite confused when he had to sit down to table with us at supper the passengers great patriots all talking of hanging the aristocrat from the lanterns increased his dismay the thought that at the end of all this he would be obliged to pass through the austrian army in order to fight in the army of the princess completely turned his brain he drank heavily and climbed into the diligence again we went back to the coupe in the middle of the night we heard the passengers shouting with their heads out of the windows stop postilion stop they stopped the door of the diligence was opened and immediately male and female voices exclaimed get down citizen get down we can't stand this get down you beast he's a brigand get down get down we got down too and saw st louis hustled flung out of the coach stand up turn his wide open but sleeping eyes around him and take to flight in the direction of paris without his hat and as fast as his legs would carry him we were unable to acknowledge him or we should have betrayed ourselves we had to leave him to his fate he was caught and taken up at the first village and stated that he was a servant of monsieur le comte de chateaubriand and that he lived in the rue de bondy paris the rural police passed him on from brigade to brigade to the president de rosambos the unhappy man's deposition served to prove our emigration and to send my brother and sister-in-law to the scaffold 
the next day when the diligence stopped for breakfast we had to listen to the whole story a score of times that man had a perturbed imagination he was dreaming out loud he said strange things he was no doubt a conspirator an assassin fleeing from justice the well-bred citizenesses blushed and waved large green paper constitutional fans we easily recognised through these stories the effects of somnambulism fear and wine on reaching lille we went in search of the person who was to take us across the frontier the emigration had its agents of safety who eventually became agents of perdition the monarchical party was still powerful the question undecided the weak and cowardly served while awaiting the turn of events we left lille before the gates were closed we stopped at a remote house and did not start until ten o'clock at night when it was quite dark we carried nothing with us we had a little cane in our hands it was no more than a year since i in the same way followed my dutchman in the american forests we crossed cornfields through which wound hardly traceable footpaths the french and austrian patrols were beating the countryside we were liable to fall in with either or to find ourselves in front of the pistols of a vedette we saw a single horseman in the distance motionless weapon in hand we heard the hoofs of horses in the hollow roads laying our ears against the ground we heard the regular tramp of infantry marching after three hours spent alternately in running and in creeping along on tiptoe we reached a cross-road in a wood where some belated nightingales were singing a troop of uhlans posted behind a hedge fell upon us with raised sabres we shouted officers going to join the princess we asked to be taken to tournay saying we were in a position to make ourselves known the officer in command placed us between his troopers and carried us off when day broke the uhlans perceived our national guards uniforms under our surtouts and insulted the colours in which france was soon to dress her vassal europe in tonnecy the primitive kingdom of the franks clovis resided during the early years of his reign he set out from tournay with his companions summoned as he was to the conquest of the gauls arms always have right on their side says tacitus through this town from which in four hundred and eighty six the first king of the first race rode to found his long and mighty monarchy i passed in seventeen ninety two to go and join the princes of the third race on foreign soil and i passed through it again in eighteen fifteen when the last king of the french abandoned the kingdom of the first king of the franks omnia migrant when we reached tournay i left my brother to grapple with the authorities and in the custody of a soldier visited the cathedral in days of old odo of orleans the scholasticus of the cathedral seated at night before the church porch taught his disciples the course of the planets and pointed out to them the milky way and the stars i would rather have found this artless eleventh century astronomer at tournay than the pandours i delight in those days in which the chronicles tell me under the year ten forty nine that in normandy a man had been transformed into a donkey that was like to have happened to me as the reader knows at the house of the demoiselle coupin who taught me to read hildebert in eleven fourteen saw a girl from whose ears grew spikes of corn perhaps it was Ceres. the meuse which i was soon to cross was suspended in mid-air in the year eleven eighteen as witness guillaume de nangy and alberic rigord shows us that in eleven ninety four between compiegne and clermont and beauvoisy there fell a storm of hail mixed with ravens which carried charcoal and caused a fire if the tempest as gervaise of tilbury tells us was unable to extinguish a candle on the window-sill of the priory of saint michel de camisa we also know through him that in the diocese of uzes there was a fair and clear spring which changed its place when anything unclean was thrown into it our latter-day consciences do not put themselves out for so little reader i am not wasting time i am chatting with you to keep you in patience while waiting for my brother who is arranging things here he comes after explaining himself to the satisfaction of the austrian commander we have leave to go on to brussels an exile purchased with too much care and trouble brussels was the headquarters of the upper emigration the most elegant women of paris and the most fashionable men those who were able to march only as aides de camp were awaiting amid pleasures the moment of victory they had fine brand new uniforms they paraded the very pedantry of frivolity considerable sums enough to keep them for a few years were squandered in a few days it was not worth while economizing since we should be in paris directly those gallant knights reversing the practice of the olden chivalry were preparing for glory with successes in love they scornfully watched us trudging on foot knapsack on back small provincial gentlemen that we were or poor officers turned into private soldiers those hercules sat at the feet of the Amphali, spinning the distaffs which they had sent us and which we handed back to them as we passed contenting ourselves with our swords in brussels i found my scanty luggage which had fraudulently passed the customs ahead of me it consisted of my navarre uniform a little linen and my precious papers with which i could not part i was invited with my brother to dine at the baron de breteuil's i there met the baron de montmorency then young and beautiful at this moment dying 
martyr bishops in watered silk cassocks and gold crosses young magistrates transformed into hungarian colonels and rivarol whom i saw only once in my life his name had not been mentioned i was struck by the conversation of a man who held forth all alone and was listened to with some right as an oracle rivarol's wit was prejudicial to his talent as his tongue was to his pen talking of revolutions he said the first blow aims at god the second strikes only a senseless slab of marble i had resumed my uniform of a petty infantry subaltern i was to start on rising from dinner and my knapsack was behind the door i was still bronzed by the american sun and the sea air i wore my hair uncurled and unpowdered my face and my silence troubled rivarol the baron de breteuil perceiving his restless curiosity satisfied it where does your brother the chevalier come from he asked my brother i answered from niagara rivarol cried from the cataract i was silent he hazarded an uncompleted question monsieur is going where they are fighting i broke in we rose from table this fatuous emigrant society was hateful to me i was eager to see my peers emigrants like myself with six hundred francs a year we were very stupid no doubt but at least we aired our sword blades and if we had obtained any successes we should have been the last to profit by victory my brother remained at brussels with the baron de montboissier who appointed him his aide-de-camp i set out alone for coblenz there is no more historic road than that which i followed it recalled in every part some memory or greatness of france i passed through liege one of those municipal republics which so often rose against their bishops or against the counts of flanders louis the eleventh the ally of the liegeois was obliged to assist at the sack of their town in order to escape from his ridiculous prison of perron i was about to join and to become one of the soldiers who glory in such things in seventeen ninety two the relations between liege and france were more peaceful the abbot of saint hubert was obliged every year to send two hounds to king dagobert's successors at aix la chapelle there was another offering but on the part of france the pall that had served at the funeral of a most christian king was sent to the tomb of charlemagne as a vassal banner to the lord's fief our kings thus did fealty and homage on taking possession of the inheritance of eternity laying their hands between the knees of their liege lady death they swore to be faithful to her after pressing the feudal kiss on her mouth this however was the only suzerain of whom france acknowledged herself the vassal the cathedral of aix-la-chapelle was built by karl the great and consecrated by leo the third two prelates failing to attend the ceremony their places were filled by two bishops of maastricht long deceased and resuscitated for the purpose charlemagne having lost a beautiful mistress pressed her body in his arms and refused to be separated from it his passion was attributed to a charm the young corpse was examined and a tiny pearl found beneath the tongue the pearl was flung into a marsh charlemagne became madly enamoured of the marsh and ordered it to be filled up there he built a palace and a church to spend his life in one and his death in the other the authorities here are archbishop turpin and petrarch at cologne i admired the cathedral if it were finished it would be the finest gothic monument in europe the monks were the painters the sculptors the architects and the masons of their basilicas they gloried in the title of master mason cementarius it is curious to hear ignorant philosophers and chattering democrats cry out to-day against the monks as though those frock proletarians those mendicant orders to whom we owe almost everything had been gentlemen cologne reminded me of caligula and st bruno i have seen the remains of the dykes built by the former at baie and the deserted cell of the latter at the grand chartreuse i went up the rhine as far as coblenz confluentia the army of the princes was no longer there i crossed those empty kingdoms in Regna i saw the beautiful valley of the rhine the tempe of the barbarian muses where the knights appeared around the ruins of their castles where one hears the clash of arms at night when war is at hand between coblenz and treves i fell in with the prussian army i was passing along the column when coming up with the guards i noticed that they were marching in battle order with cannon in line the king and the duke of brunswick were in the centre of the square the composer frederick's old grenadiers my white uniform caught the king's eye he sent for me the duke of brunswick and he took off their hats and saluted the old french army in my person they asked me my name my regiment the place where i was going to join the princess this military welcome touched me i replied with emotion that on learning in america of my king's misfortunes i had returned to shed my blood in his service the generals and officers surrounding frederick william made a movement of approbation and the prussian sovereign said sir one always recognizes the sentiments of the french nobility he took off his hat again and stood uncovered and motionless until i had disappeared behind the mass of the grenadiers nowadays people cry out against the emigrants they are tigers who rent their mother's bosom at the time of which i speak men love the examples of old and honour ranked as high as country in seventeen ninety two fidelity to one's oath was still accounted a duty to-day it has become so rare 
that is regarded as a virtue a strange scene already rehearsed with others than myself almost made me retrace my steps they refused to admit me at treves where the army of the princes was i was one of those men who await the course of events before making up their minds i ought to have joined the cantonment three years ago i came when victory was assured they had no use for me they had only too many of those heroes after the battle every day squadrons of cavalry were deserting even the artillery was melting away in a body and if that went on they would not know what to do with those people o oh, prodigious illusionment of parties i met my cousin armand de chateaubriand he took me under his protection assembled the bretons and pleaded my cause they sent for me i made my explanation i told them that i had come from america to have the honour of serving beside my comrades that the campaign was open not commenced so that i was still in time for the first fire that however i would go back if they insisted but not before i had obtained satisfaction for an undeserved insult the matter was arranged as i was a good fellow the ranks were open to receive me and my only difficulty was to make my selection the army of the princes was composed of gentlemen classed by provinces and serving as private soldiers the nobility was harking back to its origin and to the origin of the monarchy at the very moment when both the nobility and monarchy were coming to an end even as an old man returns to childhood there were moreover brigades of emigrant officers of different regiments who had also become soldiers among these were my messmates of navarre with their colonel the marquis de mortemar at their head i was strongly tempted to enlist with la martiniere even though he should still be in love but armorican patriotism won the day i enrolled myself in the seventh breton company commanded by m de goyon miniac the nobles of my province had furnished seven companies to these was added an eighth consisting of young men of the third estate the steel-grey uniform of this last company differed from that of the others which was royal blue with ermine facings men attached to the same cause and exposed to the same dangers perpetuated their political inequalities by odious distinctions the true heroes were the plebeian soldiers since no consideration of personal interest entered into the sacrifice they made enumeration of our little army infantry of gentlemen soldiers and officers four companies of deserters dressed in the different uniforms of the regiments from which they came one company of artillery a few officers of engineers with some guns howitzers and mortars of various calibres the artillery and engineers almost all of whom embraced the cause of the revolution achieved its success across the borders a very fine cavalry consisting of german carabineers musketeers under the command of the old comte de montmorin and naval officers from brest rochefort and toulon supported our infantry the wholesale emigration of these last-named officers plunged naval france back into the condition of weakness from which louis the sixteenth had extricated it never since the days of duquesne and tourville had our squadrons covered themselves with more glory my comrades were delighted i had tears in my eyes when i saw pass before them those ocean dragons who no longer commanded the ships with which they had humbled the english and delivered america instead of going in search of new continents to bequeath to france these companies of la perouse sank into the mud of germany they rode the horse dedicated to neptune but they had changed their element and the land was not for them in vain their commander carried at their head the tattered ensign of the belle poule the sacred relic of the white flag from whose shreds honour still hung but victory had fallen we had tents we lacked all beside our muskets of german make trumpery weapons and frightfully heavy broke our shoulders and were often not in a condition to be fired i went through the whole campaign with one of these firelocks the hammer of which refused to fall we remained two days at treves it was a great pleasure to me to see roman ruins after having seen the nameless ruins of ohio to visit that town so often sacked of which salvanius said o fugitives from treves you ask again for theatres you demand a circus of the princes for what state i pray you for what people for what city theatra gitu quiritis circum a principibus postulatis qui quaeso statute qui populo qui civitati fugitives from france where was the people for which we wished to restore the monuments of st louis i sat down with my musket among the ruins i took from my knapsack the manuscript of my travels in america i arranged the separate sheets on the grass around me i read over and corrected a description of a forest a passage of atala in the fragments of a roman amphitheatre preparing in this way to make the conquest of france then i put away my treasure the weight of which combined with that of my shirts my cloak my tin can my wicker bottle and my little homer made me throw up blood i tried to stuff atala into my cartridge box with my useless ammunition my comrades made fun of me and pulled at the sheets which stuck out on either side of the leather cover providence came to my rescue one night after sleeping in a hayloft i found when i woke that my shirts were no longer in my sack the thieves had left the papers i praise god that accident assured my fame and saved my life for the sixty pounds that pressed upon my shoulders would have driven me into a consumption how many shirts have i asked henry the fourth of his body-servant 
one dozen sire and some of them are torn and of handkerchiefs is it not eight that i have there are only five left now the Bernese won the battle of ivry without shirts the loss of mine did not enable me to restore his kingdom to his descendants end of book seven part one Book seven, part two of part one of volume two of the memoirs of Chateaubriand. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. The memoirs of Chateaubriand, volume two, part one by Francois Rene de Chateaubriand. Translated by Alexander Texera de Matos. Book seven, part two. We receive orders to march on Thionville we did five to six leagues a day the weather was terrible we tramped through the rain and slush singing au richard au mon roi and pauvre jacques on arriving at the encamping place having neither wagons nor provisions we went with donkeys which followed the column like an arab caravan to hunt for food in the farms and villages we paid for everything scrupulously nevertheless i had to do fatigue duty for taking two pairs from the garden of a country house without thinking a great steeple a great river and a great lord are bad neighbours says the proverb we pitched our tents at random and were constantly obliged to beat the canvas in order to flatten out the threads and prevent the water from coming through we were ten soldiers to every tent each in turn took charge of the cooking one went for meat another for bread another for wood another for straw i made wonderful soup i received great compliments on it especially when i mixed milk and cabbage with the stew in the breton way i had learnt among the iroquois not to mind smoke so that i bore myself bravely before my fire of green and damp boughs this soldier's life is very amusing i imagine myself still among the indians as we sat at mess in our tent my comrades asked me for tales of my travels they told me some fine stories in return we all lied like a corporal in a tavern with a conscript paying the reckoning one thing tired me washing my linen it had to be done and often for the obliging robber had left me only one shirt borrowed from my cousin armand besides the one on my back when i lay soaping my stockings my pocket handkerchiefs and my shirt by the edge of a stream with my head down and my loins up i was seized with fits of giddiness the motion of the arms gave me an unbearable pain in the chest i was obliged to sit down among the horse-tails and watercress and in the midst of the stir of war i amused myself by watching the water flow peacefully past lope de vega makes a shepherdess wash the bandage of love that shepherdess would have been very useful to me for a little birch-cloth turban which my floridans had given me an army is generally composed of soldiers of nearly the same age the same height the same strength very different was ours a jumble gathering of grown men old men children fresh from the dovecote jabbering norman breton picard auvergnat gascon provencal languedocian a father served with his sons a father-in-law with his son-in-law an uncle with his nephews a brother with a brother a cousin with a cousin this arriaban ridiculous as it appeared had something honourable and touching about it because it was animated with sincere convictions it presented the spectacle of the old monarchy and afforded a last glimpse of a dying world i have seen old noblemen with stern looks grey hair torn coats knapsack on back musket slung over the shoulder drag themselves along with a stick and supported by the arm by one of their sons i have seen m de boisy the father of my schoolfellow killed at the states of rennes in my sight march solitary and sad with his bare feet in the mud carrying his shoes at the point of his bayonet for fear of wearing them out i have seen young wounded men lie under a tree while a chaplain in surtout and stole knelt by their side sending them to st louis whose heirs they had striven to defend the whole of this needy band which received not a sou from the princes made war at its own expense while the decrees finished despoiling it and threw our wives and mothers into prison the old men of former times were less unhappy and less lonely than those of to-day if in lingering upon earth they had lost their friends there was but little change around them besides they were strangers to youth but not to society nowadays a lagger in this world has witnessed the death not only of men but of ideas principles manners tastes pleasures pains opinions none of these resemble what he used to know he belongs to a race different from that among which he ends his days and yet o oh nineteenth-century france learn to prize that old france which was as good as you you will grow old in your turn and you will be accused as we were accused of clinging to obsolete ideas the men whom you have vanquished are your fathers do not deny them you are sprung from their blood had they not been generously faithful to the ancient traditions you would not have drawn from that native fidelity the energy which has been the cause of your glory in the new traditions between the old france and the new 
all that has happened is a transformation of virtue near our poor and obscure camp was another which was brilliant and rich at the staff one saw nothing but wagons full of eatables met with none save cooks valets aides de camp nothing could have better reproduced the court and the provinces the monarchy expiring at versailles and the monarchy dying on du Gesclin's heaths we had grown to hate the aides de camp whenever there was an engagement outside thionville we shouted forward the aides de camp just as the patriots used to shout forward the officers i felt a chill at my heart when arriving one dark day in sight of some woods that lined the horizon we were told that those woods were in france to cross the frontier of my country in arms had an effect upon me which i am unable to convey i had as it were a sort of revelation of the future inasmuch as i shared none of my comrades illusions either with regard to the cause they were supporting or the thoughts of triumph with which they deluded themselves i was there like falkland in the army of charles i there was not a knight of the mancha sick lame wearing a nightcap under his three-cornered beaver but was most firmly convinced of his ability unaided to put fifty young and vigorous patriots to flight this honourable and agreeable pride at another time the source of prodigies had not attacked me i did not feel so sure of the strength of my invincible arm we reached thionville unconquered on the first of september for we had met nobody on the road the cavalry encamped to the right the infantry to the left of the high road running from the town towards germany the fortress was not visible from the camping-ground but six hundred paces ahead one came to the bridge of a hill whence the eye swept the valley of the moselle the mounted men of the navy joined the right of our infantry to the austrian corps of the prince of waldeck while the left of the infantry was covered by eighteen hundred horse of the maison rouge and royal german regiments we entrenched our front with a fosse along which the arms were stalked in line the eight breton companies occupied two intersecting streets of the camp and below us was dressed the company of the navarre officers my former messmates when these field-works which took three days were completed monsieur and the comte d'artois arrived they reconnoitred the place which was called upon in vain to surrender although wimpfen seemed willing to do so like the grand conde we had not won the battle of rocroi and so we were not able to capture thionville but we were not beaten under its walls like fouquier we took up a position on the high road at the end of a village which formed a suburb of the town outside the hornwork which defended the bridge over the moselle the troops fired at each other from the houses our post remained in possession of those which it had taken i was not present at this first action armand my cousin was there and behaved well while they were fighting in the village my company was requisitioned to establish a battery on the skirt of a wood which capped the summit of a hill along the slope of this hill vineyards ran down to the plain joining the outer fortifications of thionville the engineer directing us made us throw up a gazon cavalier for our guns we drew a parallel open trench to place us below the cannon-balls these earthworks took long in making for we were all young officers and old alike unaccustomed to wield the mattock and spade we had no wheelbarrows and carried the earth in our coats which we used as sacks fire was opened on us from a lunette it was the more irksome to us in that we were unable to reply eight pounders and a cohorn howitzer which was out range formed all our artillery the first shell we fired fell outside the glacis and aroused the jeers of the garrison a few days later we were joined by some austrian guns and gunners one hundred infantry men and a picket of the naval cavalry were relieved at this battery every twenty-four hours the besieged prepared to attack it we could distinguish a movement on the rampart through the telescope when night fell we saw a column issue through a postern and reach the lunette under shelter of the covert way my company was ordered up as a reinforcement at daybreak five or six hundred patriots began operations in the village on the high road above the town then turning to the left they came through the vineyards to take our battery in flank the sailors charged bravely but were overthrown and unmasked us we were too badly armed to return the fire we pushed forward with fixed bayonets the attacking party retreated i know not why had they held their ground they would have wiped us out we had several wounded and a few dead among others the chevalier de la baronnet captain of one of the breton companies i brought him ill luck the bullet which took his life ricocheted against the barrel of my musket and struck him with such force as to pierce both his temples his brains were scattered over my face noble and unnecessary victim of a lost cause when the maréchal d'aubeterre held the states of brittany he went to monsieur de la baronnet the father a poor nobleman living at dinard near st malo the marshal who had begged him to invite nobody saw on entering a table laid for twenty-five and scolded his host in friendly fashion monseigneur said monsieur de la baronnet i have only my children to dinner monsieur de la baronnet had twenty-two boys and a girl all by the same mother the revolution reaped this rich family harvest 
before it was ripe. Wildex Austrian Corps began operations. The attack became livelier on our side. It was a fine spectacle at night. Firepots lit up the works of the place covered with soldiers. Sudden gleams struck the clouds or the blue firmament when the guns were fired, and the bombs, crossing each other in the air, described a parabola of light. In the intervals between the reports one heard drums rolling, gusts of military music, and the voices of the sentries on the ramparts of Thionville, and at our own posts. Unfortunately, they called out in French in both camps, Sentinelle, prenez garde à vous, all's well. When the fighting took place at dawn, it would happen that the lark's morning hymn followed upon the sound of musketry, while the guns which had ceased firing silently stared at us with gaping mouths through the embrasures. The song of the bird, recalling the memories of pastoral life, seemed to utter a reproach to mankind. It was the same when I came across some dead bodies in the middle of fields of lucerne in flower, or by the edge of a stream of water which bathed the hair of the slain. In the woods, at a few steps from the stress of war, I found little statues of the saints and the virgin. A goat-herd, a neat-herd, a beggar carrying his wallet, knelt beside these peacemakers, telling their beads to the distant sound of cannon. A whole township once came with its minister to present flowers to the patron of a neighbouring parish, whose image dwelt in a wood opposite a spring. The curate was blind. A soldier in God's army, he had lost his sight in doing good works, like a grenadier on the battlefield. The vicar administered communion for his curate, because the latter could not have laid the consecrated wafer upon the lips of the communicants. During this ceremony, and from the depths of night, he blessed the light. Our fathers believed that the patrons of the hamlets, John the Silent, Dominic Loricatus, James Intercisus, Paul the Simple, Basil the Hermit, and so many others, were no strangers to the triumph of the arms which protect the harvests. On the very day of the Battle of Bouvines, robbers broke into a convent dedicated to St. Germanus at Auxerre, and stole the consecrated vessels. The sacristan went to the shrine of the blessed bishop, and said plaintively, Germanus, where wert thou when those thieves dared to violate thy sanctuary? A voice issuing from the shrine replied, I was near Cisoin, not far from Bouvine Bridge. Together with other saints, I was helping the French and their king, to whom a brilliant victory has been given by our aid. Qui fuit auxilio victoria praestita nostre. We beat the plain, and pushed as far as the hamlets lying under the first entrenchments of Thionville. The village on the high road crossing the Moselle was constantly being captured and recaptured. I took part in two of these assaults. The patriots abused us as enemies of liberty, aristocrats, and capet satellites. We called them brigands, murderers, traitors, and revolutionaries. Sometimes we stopped fighting while a duel took place in the midst of the combatants, who became impartial seconds. O oh, strange French character, which even passions were unable to stifle. One day, I was on patrol in a vineyard. Twenty paces from me was an old sporting nobleman, who banged the muzzle of his musket against the vine-stocks as though to start a hare, and then looked sharply round in the hope of seeing a patriot leap out. Everyone had brought his own habits with him. Another day I went to visit the Austrian camp. Between the camp and that of the naval cavalry, a wood spread its screen, against which the place was directing an inexpedient fire. The town was shooting too much. It believed us to be more numerous than we were, which explains the pompous bulletins of the command of Thionville. While crossing this wood I saw something move in the grass. A man lay stretched at full length, with his nose against the ground, showing only his broad back. I thought he was wounded. I took him by the nape of the neck and half lifted his head. He opened a pair of terror-struck eyes and raised himself a little upon his hands. I burst out laughing. It was my cousin Moreau. I had not seen him since our visit to Madame de Chastenay. He had lain flat on his stomach to escape a bomb, and found it impossible to get up again. I had all the difficulty in the world to set him on his legs. His paunch was three times its former size. He told me that he was serving on the commissariat, and that he was on his way to offer some oxen to the Prince of Waldeck. In addition to this, he carried a rosary. Hugues Mettel tells of a wolf which resolved to embrace the monastic condition, but which, failing to accustom itself to the fasting diet, became a cannon. As I returned to camp, an officer of engineers passed close by me, leading his horse by the bridle. A cannonball struck the animal in the narrowest part of the neck and cut it right off. The head and neck remained hanging in the officer's hand and dragged him to the ground with their weight. I had seen a bomb fall in the middle of a ring of naval officers who were sitting eating in a circle. The mess platter disappeared. The officers, tumbling head over heels and run as it were on a sandbank, shouted like the old sea captain, Fire starboard guns, fire larboard guns, fire all guns, fire my wig. These singular shots seemed to pertain to Thionville. In 1558, François de Guise laid siege to the place. Marshal Strozzi was killed, while talking in the trenches to the aforesaid Sir de Guise, who had his hand on his shoulder at the time. 
a sort of market had been formed behind our camp the peasants had brought octaves of white moselle wine which remained on the wagons the horses were taken out and ate fastened to one end of the cart while the soldiers drank at the other end here and there gleamed the fires of ovens sausages were fried in pans hasty puddings boiled in basins pancakes tossed on iron dishes puff-cakes swollen out on hampers cakes flavoured with aniseed rye loaves at one sou maize cakes green apples red and white eggs pipes and tobacco were sold under a tree from whose branches hung coarse cloth great coats for which the passers-by haggled village women seated astride portable stools milked cows while each presented his cup to the dairy woman and waited his turn before the stoves roamed cutlers in smocks and soldiers in uniform the canteen women went about crying aloud in german and french there were groups standing others seated at deal tables planted askew on the uneven ground one sought shelter at random under a packing cloth or under branches cut in the forest as on palm sunday i believe also that there were weddings in the covered wagons in memory of the frankish kings the patriots could easily have followed margerian's example and carried away the bride's chariot rapid seda victor nubentemque lurum all sang laughed smoked the scene was extremely gay at night between the fires which lit up the earth and the stars shining overhead when i was neither on guard at the batteries nor on duty in the tent i liked supping at the fair there the stories of the camp were told again but under the influence of liquor and good cheer they became much finer one of our fellows a brevet captain whose name i have forgotten in that of dinazade which we gave him was famous for his yarns it would have been more correct to say scheherazade but we were not so careful as that as soon as we saw him we ran up to him fought for him we vied with each other as to who should have him on his score short of body long of leg with sunk cheeks drooping moustachios eyebrows forming a comma at the outer angle a hollow voice a huge sword in a coffee-coloured scabbard the carriage of a soldier pert something between the suicide and the jolly dog that solemn wag dinazard never laughed and it was impossible to look at him without laughing he was the necessary second in all the duels and the lover of all the barmaids he viewed all he said on the dark side and interrupted his recitals only to take a pull at a bottle relight his pipe or swallow a sausage one night when it was drizzling we were seated round the tap of a wine cask tilted towards us in a cart with its shafts in the air a candle stuck on the cask lighted us a piece of packing cloth stretched from the end of the shafts to two posts served us for a roof dinazard with his sword awry after the manner of frederick the second stood between one of the wheels and a horse's crupper telling a story to our great content the canteen women who brought us our rations stayed with us to listen to our arab the attentive group of bachantes and silenuses which formed the chorus accompanied the narrative with marks of its surprise approval or disapproval gentlemen said the story-teller you all knew the green knight who lived in the days of king john every one said yes yes dinazard swallowed down a rolled pancake burning himself as he did so this green knight gentleman as you know since you have seen him was very good-looking when the wind blew back his ruddy locks over his cask it looked like a twist of tow round a green turban the audience bravo one evening in may he sounded his horn at the drawbridge of a castle in picardy or auvergne no matter which in that castle lived the lady of great companies she welcomed the knight told her servants to disarm him and lead him to the bar and came and sat with him at a splendid table and the pages in waiting were mute the audience oh oh the lady gentleman was tall flat lean and shambling like the major's wife otherwise she had plenty of expression and an arch look when she laughed and showed her long teeth beneath her stumpy nose one did not know what one was about she fell in love with the knight and the knight with her although he was afraid of her dinazard emptied the ashes of his pipe on the brim of the wheel and wanted to refill his cutty they made him continue the green knight utterly dumbfounded resolved to leave the castle but before taking his leave he asked the lady of the keep for an explanation of many strange things at the same time he made her an offer of marriage always provided she was not a witch dinazard's rapier was planted stiff and straight between his knees seated and leaning forward with our pipes we made a garland of fire-flakes beneath him like saturn's ring suddenly dinazard shouted as though beside himself well gentlemen the lady of great companies was death and the captain breaking the ranks and shouting death death put the canteen women to flight the meeting was closed the uproar was great the laughter prolonged we approached Thionville amid the roar of the cannon of the place the siege continued or rather there was no siege for the trenches were not open and troops were wanting to invest the place regularly we reckoned on receiving intelligence and waited for news of the successes of the prussian army or of clerfait's army with which was the french corps of the duc de bourbon our scanty supplies were becoming exhausted paris seemed to draw further away the bad weather never ceased we were flooded in the midst of our works i sometimes woke in a trench with water up to my neck the next day i was a cripple 
Among my fellow Bretons I had met Ferrand de la Cigonnière, my old class fellow at Dinan. We slept badly under our tent. Our heads went beyond the canvas and received the rain from that sort of gutter. I would get up and go with Ferrand to walk in front of the stacked arms. For all our evenings were not so gay as those with Dinazade. We walked in silence, listening to the voices of the sentries, looking at the lights of our streets of tents, as we had formerly watched the lamps in the passages at our college. We discussed the past and the future, the mistakes that had been made, those that would still be made. We deplored the blindness of our princes, who imagined that they could return to their country with a handful of adherents, and consolidate the crown on their brother's head with the aid of the foreigner. I remember saying to my friend, in the course of these conversations, that France wished to imitate England, that the king would perish on the scaffold, and that our expedition before Thionville would probably be one of the principal counts in the indictment of Louis the Sixteenth. Ferrand was struck by my prophecy. It was the first I ever made. Since that time I have made many others quite as true, quite as unheeded. When the accident occurred, the others took shelter and left me to struggle with the misfortune which I had foreseen. When the Dutch encounter a squall on the open sea, they retreat to the interior of the ship, close the hatches, and drink punch, leaving a dog on deck to bark at the storm. The danger passed, trust is sent back to his kennel in the hold, and the captain returns to enjoy the fine weather on the quarter-deck. I have been the Dutch dog of the legitimate ship. The memories of my life as a soldier have engraved themselves upon my thoughts. I have related them in the sixth book of the Martyrs. Armorican barbarian in the prince's camp as I was, I carried Homer with my sword. I preferred my country, the poor, small isle of Aaron, to the hundred cities of Crete. I said with Telemachus, The harsh country which only feeds goats is dearer to me than those in which horses are reared. My words would have brought a smile to the lips of the warlike Menelaus, Agathos Menelaos. The rumour spread that we were at last coming to action. The Prince of Waldeck was to attempt an assault while we were to cross the river and make a diversion by a faint attack on the place from the French side. Five Breton companies, including mine, the company of the Picardy and Navarre officers, and the regiment of volunteers, composed of young Lorraine peasants and of deserters from various regiments, were ordered up for duty. We were to be supported by the Royal Germans, the squadrons of musketeers, and the different corps of dragoons which covered our left. My brother was with this cavalry, with the Baron de Montboissier, who had married a daughter of Monsieur de Malzerbe, sister to Madame de Rosambeau, and therefore aunt to my sister-in-law. We escorted three companies of Austrian artillery, with heavy guns and a battery of three mortars. We started at six o'clock in the evening. At ten we crossed the Moselle, above Thionville, on a coppered pontoon bridge. Amena fluenta, subtela bentis tacito rumore Mosellae. At daybreak we were drawn up in order of battle on the left bank, with the heavy cavalry in echelons on both flanks, and the light cavalry in front. At our second movement we formed in column and began to defile. At about nine o'clock we heard a volley fired on our left. A carabineer officer came dashing up at full speed to tell us that a detachment of Kellerman's army was about to join issue with us, and that the action had already begun between the skirmishers. The officer's horse had been struck by a bullet on the forehead. It reared with the foam streaming from its mouth and the blood from its nostrils. The carabineer, seated sword in hand on this wounded horse, was superb. The corps which had come out of Metz manoeuvred to take us in flank. They had field pieces with them, whose fire reached our volunteer regiment. I heard the exclamations of some recruits struck by the cannonballs. The last cries of youth snatched living from life gave me a feeling of profound pity. I thought of the poor mothers. The drums beat the charge, and we rushed in disorder upon the enemy. We came so close that the smoke did not prevent us from seeing the terrible expression on the faces of men ready to shed your blood. The patriots had not yet acquired the assurance that comes from the long habit of fighting and victory. Their movements were slack, they felt their way. Fifty grenadiers of the old guard would have made head against an heterogeneous mass of undisciplined nobles, old and young. Ten to twelve hundred foot soldiers were taken aback by a few gunshots from the Austrian heavy artillery. They retreated. Our cavalry pursued them for two leagues. A deaf and dumb German girl called Libba, or Libba, had become attached to my cousin Armand, and had followed him. I found her sitting on the grass, which stained her dress with blood. Her elbow rested on her upturned knee. Her hand, passed through her tangled yellow tresses, supported her head. She wept as she looked at three or four killed men, new deaf-mutes, lying around her. She had not heard the clap of the thunderbolts of which she saw the effect, nor could she hear the sighs which escaped her lips when she looked at Armand. She had never heard the sound of the voice of him she loved, and she would not hear the first cry of the child she bore in her womb. If the grave contained only silence, she would not know that she had sunk into it. For that matter, fields of slaughter lie on every hand. In the eastern cemetery in Paris, twenty-seven thousand tombstones, Two hundred and thirty thousand corpses will show you the extent of the battle which death wages day and night at your doors. After a somewhat long halt, we resumed our march, and arrived under the walls of Thionville at nightfall. 
The drums did not beat. The word of command was given in a whisper. The cavalry, in order to repulse any sortie, stole along the roads and hedges to the gate which we were to cannonade. The Austrian artillery, protected by our infantry, took up a position at fifty yards from the advance works, behind a hastily thrown up epaulment of gabions. At one o'clock on the morning of the 1st of September, a rocket, sent up from the Prince of Waldeck's camp on the other side of the place, gave the signal. The Prince commenced a smart fire, to which the town made a vigorous reply. We began to fire forthwith. The besieged, not thinking that we had troops on that side, and not foreseeing this assault, had left the southern ramparts unprotected. We did not lose for waiting. The garrison armed a double battery, which penetrated our epaulements, and dismounted two of our guns. The sky was aflame. We were shrouded in torrents of smoke. I behaved like a little Alexander. Weakened by fatigue, I fell sound asleep, almost under the wheels of the gun carriage where I was on guard. A shell, bursting six inches off the ground, sent a splinter into my right thigh. I awoke with the shock, but felt no pain, and perceived only by my blood that I was wounded. I bound up my thigh with my handkerchief. In the affair on the plain, two bullets had struck my knapsack during a wheeling movement. Atala, like a devoted daughter, placed herself between her father and the lead of the enemy. She had still to withstand the fire of the Abbe Morellet. At four o'clock in the morning, the Prince of Waldeck's fire ceased. We thought the town had surrendered, but the gates were not opened, and we had to think of retiring. We returned to our positions, after a tiring march of three days. The Prince of Waldeck had gone as far as the edge of the ditches, which he had tried to cross, hoping to bring about a surrender by means of the simultaneous attack. Divisions were still supposed to exist in the town, and we flattered ourselves that the Royalist party would bring the keys to the princes. The Austrians, having fired in Barbette, lost a considerable number of men. The Prince of Waldeck had an arm shot off, while a few drops of blood flowed under the walls of Thionville, Blood was flowing in torrents in the prisons of Paris. My wife and sisters were in greater danger than I. We raised the siege of Thionville and set out for Verdun, which had been restored to the Allies on the 2nd of September. Longwy, the birthplace of François de Mercy, had fallen on the 23rd of August. Wreaths and festoons of flowers bore evidence on every side of the passage of Frederick William. Among the peaceful trophies I observed the Prussian eagle affixed to Vauban's fortifications. It was not to stay there long. As to the flowers, they were soon to see the innocent creatures who had gathered them fade away like themselves. One of the most atrocious murders of the terror was that of the young girls of Verdun. Fourteen young girls of Verdun, says Rieuf, of unexampled purity, who had the air of young virgins decked for a public festival, were led together to the scaffold. They disappeared suddenly, and both gathered in their springtime. The court of women, on the morrow of their death, looked like a garden plot stripped of its flowers by a storm. Never have I witnessed such despair as that which this act of barbarity excited among us. Verdun is famous for its female sacrifices. According to Gregory of Tours, Deuteric, to protect his daughter from the prosecution of Theodobert, placed her in a cart drawn by two untamed oxen, and had her flung into the Meurs. The instigator of the massacre of the young girls of Verdun was the regicide poetaster Pons de Verdun, who was infuriated against his native city. The number of agents of the terror supplied by the Armenite de Meuse is incredible. The unsatisfied vanity of the mediocrities produced as many revolutionaries as the wounded pride of the cripples and abortions, a revolt analogous to that of the infirmities of mind and body. Pons attached the point of a dagger to his blunt epigrams. Faithful, as it seemed, to the traditions of Greece, the poet was willing to offer none save the blood of virgins to his gods. For the convention decreed, on his motion, that no woman with child could be put on her trial. He also caused the sentence to be annulled, condemning Madame de Bonchamp to death, the widow of the celebrated Vendean general. Alas, we royalists in the train of the princes attain the reverses of the Vendée without passing through its glory. We had not at Verdun, to pass the time, that famous Comtesse de saint Balmont, who laid aside her female apparel, mounted on horseback, and herself served as an escort to the ladies who accompanied her, or whom she had left in her chariot. We had no passion for old Gallic, nor did we write notes in the language of Amadis. The Prussian evil communicated itself to our little army. I caught it. Our cavalry had gone to join Frederick William at Valmy. We knew nothing of what was happening, and were hourly expecting the order to march forward. We received the order to beat a retreat. Very greatly weakened, and prevented by my troublesome wound from walking without pain, I dragged myself as best I could in the wake of my company, which soon dispersed. Jean Ballieu, son of a miller at Verdun, left his father's house at a very early age with a monk, who burdened him with his wallet. On leaving Verdun, Ford Hill, according to Sommers, Verdunum, I carried the wallet of the monarchy, but I did not become controller of finance, nor bishop or cardinal. 
if in the novels which i have written i have drawn upon my own history in the histories which i have told i have placed memories of the living history in which i took part thus in my life of the duke de berry i describe some of the scenes which took place before my eyes when an army is disbanded it returns to its homes but had the soldiers of Condé's army any homes? Whither was the stick to lead them, which they were hardly permitted to cut in the forests of Germany, after laying down the musket which they had taken up in defence of their king? The time had come to part. The brothers-in-arms bade each other a last farewell, and took different roads on earth. All before setting out went to salute their father and captain, white-haired old Condé. The patriarch of glory gave his blessing to his children, wept over his dispersed tribe, and saw the tents of his camp fall, with the grief of a man witnessing the destruction of his ancestral roof. Less than twenty years later, the leader of the new French army, Bonaparte, also took leave of his companions. So quickly do men and empires pass, so little does the most extraordinary renown save one from the most common destiny. We left Verdun. The rains had broken up the roads. Everywhere one saw ammunition wagons, gun carriages, cannons stuck in the mire, chariots overturned, cutler women with their children on their backs, soldiers dying or dead in the mud crossing a ploughed field i sank down to my knees ferron and another comrade dragged me out despite myself i begged them to leave me there i had rather died on the sixteenth of october at the camp near longwy the captain of my company m de goyen miniac handed me a very honourable certificate at arlon we saw a file of wagons with their teams on the high road the horses some standing others kneeling down others with their noses on the ground were dead and their bodies had grown stiff between the shafts. It was as though one saw the shades of a battlefield bivouacking on the shores of Styx. Ferron asked me what I meant to do, and I answered that, if I could go as far as Ostend, I would take ship for Jersey, where I should find my uncle de Bede. From there I should be able to join the Royalists in Brittany. The fever was sapping my strength. I could only with difficulty support myself on my swollen thigh. I felt a new ailment lay hold of me. After twenty-four hours vomiting, my face and body were covered with an eruption. Confluent smallpox broke out. It appeared to be affected by the temperature of the air. In this condition, I set out on foot to make a journey of two hundred leagues, rich as I was to the extent of eighteen livres tournois, all this for the greater glory of the monarchy. Ferron, who had lent me my six small crowns of three francs, left me, he having arranged to be met in Luxembourg. As I was leaving Arlon, a peasant took me up in his cart for the sum of four sous, and put me down five leagues further on a heap of stones. I hopped a few paces with the aid of my crutch, and washed the bandage round my scratch, which had developed into a sore, in a spring rustling by the roadside, which did me a great deal of good. The smallpox had come quite out, and I felt relieved. I had not abandoned my knapsack, the straps of which cut my shoulders. I spent that first night in a barn, and had nothing to eat. The wife of the farmer who owned the barn refused payment for my lodging, at daybreak she brought me a great basin of coffee and milk, with a black loaf which I thought excellent. I resumed my road quite merrily, although I often fell. I was joined by four or five of my comrades, who carried my knapsack. They were also very ill. We met villagers. By taking cart after cart we covered a sufficient distance in the Ardennes, in five days, to reach Atter, Flamizol, and Bellevue. On the sixth day I found myself alone. My smallpox had grown paler and was less puffy. After walking two leagues, which took me six hours, I saw a gypsy family encamp behind a ditch around a furze fire, with two goats and a donkey. I had no sooner reached them than I let myself drop to the ground, and the strange creatures hastened to succour me. A young woman in rags, lively, dark, and mischievous, sang, leapt, skipped around, holding her child aslant upon her breast, as though it were hurdy-gurdy with which she was enlivening her dance. She next squatted on her heels close by my side, examined me curiously by the light of the fire, took my dying hand to tell me my fortune, and asked me for a little sou. It was too dear. It would be difficult to possess more knowledge, charm, and wretchedness than my Sibyl of the Ardennes. I do not know when the nomads, of whom I should have been a worthy son, left me. They were not there when I woke from my torpor at dawn. My fortune-teller had gone away with the secret of my future. In exchange for my little sou, she had laid by my head an apple, which served to refresh my mouth. I shook myself, like John Rabbit, among the time and the dew, but I was not able to browse, nor to trot, nor to cut many pranks. Nevertheless, I rose with the intention of paying my court to Aurora. She was very beautiful, and I very ugly. Her rosy face proclaimed her good health. She was better than the poor Cephalus of Armorica. Although both of us young, we were old friends. 
and I imagined that her tears that morning were shed for me. I penetrated into the forest, feeling not too sad. Solitude had restored me to my own nature. I hummed the ballad by the ill-fated Cazotte. Tout au beau milieu des Ardennes, et un château sur le haut d'un rocher. Was it not in the donjon of this ghostly castle that Philip the Second, King of Spain, imprisoned my fellow Breton, Captain La Noue, who had a Chateaubriand for his grandmother? Philip consented to release the illustrious prisoner if the latter consented to have his eyes put out. La Noue was on the point of accepting the proposal, so great was his longing to return to his dear Brittany. Alas! I was possessed with the same desire, and to lose my sight, I needed only the ailment with which it had pleased God to afflict me. I did not meet Sir Enguerrand coming from Spain, but poor wretches, small peddlers who, like myself, carried their whole fortune on their back. A woodcutter with felt kneecaps entered the woods. He should have taken me for a dead branch and cut me down. A few carrion crows, a few larks, a few buntings, a kind of large finches, hopped along the road or stood motionless on the border of stones, watchful of the sparrowhawk which hovered circling in the sky. From time to time I heard the sound of the horn of the swineherd, watching his sows and their little ones acorning. I rested in a shepherd's movable hut. I found no one at home except Puss, who made me a thousand graceful caresses. The shepherd was standing a long way off, in the centre of a common pasture, with his dog sitting at irregular distances around the sheep. By day that herdsman gathered simples. He was a doctor and a wizard. By night he watched the stars. Then he was a Chaldean shepherd. I stood still half a league further, in a pasturage of deer. Hunters went by at the other end. A spring murmured at my feet. At the bottom of this spring Orlando, in Amorato, not Furioso, saw a palace of crystal filled with ladies and knights. If the paladin, who joined the dazzling water nymphs, had at least left golden bridle at the brink of the well, if Shakespeare had sent me Rosalind and the exiled duke, they would have been very helpful to me. After taking breath I continued my road. My impaired ideas floated in a void that was not without charm. My old phantoms, having scarce the consistency of shades three parts effaced, crowded round me to bid me farewell. I had no longer the power of memory. I beheld, at an indeterminate distance, the aerial forms of my relations and my friends, mingled with unknown figures. When I sat down to rest against a milestone, I thought I saw faces smile to me, in the threshold of the distant cabins, in the blue smoke escaping from the roofs of the cottages, in the tree-tops, in the transparency of the clouds, in the luminous sheaves of the sun, dragging its beams over the heather like a golden rake. These apparitions were those of the muses coming to assist the poet's death. My tomb, dug with the uprights of their lyres under an oak of the Ardennes, would have fairly well suited the soldier and the traveller. Some hazel hens, which had strayed into the forms of the hares under the privets, alone with the insects, produced a few murmurs around me, lives as slender as unknown as my life. I could walk no further, I felt extremely ill. The smallpox was turning in and choking me. Towards the end of the day I lay down on my back in a ditch, with a talas knapsack under my head, my crutch by my side, my eyes fixed upon the sun, whose light was going out with my own. I greeted in all gentleness of thought the luminary which had lighted my first youth on my paternal moors. We retired to rest together, he to rise in greater glory, I, according to all appearances, never to wake again. I fainted away in a feeling of religion. The last sounds I heard were the fall of a leaf and the whistling of a bullfinch. It seems that I lay unconscious for nearly two hours. The wagons of the Prince de Ligne happened to pass. One of the drivers, stopping to cut a birch twig, stumbled over me without seeing me. He thought me dead and pushed me with his foot. I gave a sign of life. The driver called his comrades, and prompted by an instinct of pity, they threw me into a cart. The jolting revived me. I was able to talk to my deliverers. I told them that I was a soldier of the Prince's army, and that if they would take me as far as Brussels, where I was going, I would reward them for their trouble. All right, mate, said one of them, but you have to get down at Namur, for we're forbidden to carry anybody. We'll take you up again, to the side of the town. I asked for something to drink. I swallowed a few drops of brandy, which threw the symptoms of my disease out again, and relieved my chest for a moment. Nature had endowed me with extraordinary strength. We reached the suburbs of Namur at ten o'clock in the morning. I got down and followed the wagons at a distance. I soon lost sight of them. I was stopped at the entrance to the town. I sat down under the gateway, while my papers were being examined. The soldiers on guard, seeing my uniform, offered me a scrap of ammunition bread, and the corporal handed me some peppered brandy in a blue glass drinking cup. I made some ceremony about drinking out of the cup of military hospitality. Catch hold, he exclaimed angrily, accompanying his injunction with a sacrament de teufel. My passage through Namur was a laborious one. 
I walked leaning against the houses. The first woman who saw me left her shop, gave me her arm with a pitying air, and helped me to drag myself along. I thanked her, and she replied, No, no, soldier. Soon other women came running up, bringing bread, wine, fruit, milk, soup, old clothes, blankets. He's wounded, said some in their Brabanson French dialect. He has a smallpox, cried others, and kept back their children. But, young man, you will not be able to walk. You will die if you do. Stay in the hospital. They wanted to take me to the hospital. They relieved each other from door to door, and in this way helped me to the gate of the town, outside which I found the wagons again. You have seen a peasant woman succour me. You shall see another woman show me hospitality in Guernsey. Women who have aided me in my distress, if you be still living, may God help you in your old age and in your sorrows. If you have departed this life, may your children share the happiness which heaven has long refused me. The women of Namur assisted me to climb into the wagon, recommended me to the driver's care, and compelled me to accept a woollen blanket. I noticed that they treated me with a sort of respect and deference. There is something superior, something delicate, in the nature of Frenchmen, which other nations recognise. The Prince de Lien's men put me down for the second time on the road just outside Brussels, and refused to accept my last crown piece. In Brussels not one innkeeper was willing to take me in. The wandering Jew, the popular Orestes, whom the ballad represents as going to that town, Contifut dans la ville de Bruxelles en Brabant, met with a better reception than I, for he had always five sous in his pocket. I knocked, they opened, when they saw me they said, Move on, move on, and shut the door in my face. I was driven out of a café. My hair hung over my face, hidden behind my beard and moustachios. I had a hay bandage round my thigh. Over my tattered uniform I wore the blanket of the Namu women, knotted round my throat by way of a cloak. The beggar in the Odyssey was more insolent, but not so poor as I. I had at first presented myself to no purpose at the hotel where I had stayed with my brother. I made a second attempt. As I approached the door, I saw the Comte de Chateaubriand stepping from a carriage with the Baron de Montboissier. He was alarmed at my spectral appearance. They looked for a room outside the hotel, for the proprietor absolutely refused to admit me. A wig-maker offered me a den suited to my wretchedness. My brother brought me a surgeon and a doctor. He had received letters from Paris. M. de Malzerbe invited him to return to France. He told me of the day's work of the 10th of August, the massacres of September, and the political news, of which I knew not a word. He approved of my plan to cross to Jersey, and advanced me twenty-five louis. My impaired sight hardly permitted me to distinguish my brother's features. I believe that that gloom emanated from myself whereas it was the shadow which eternity was spreading around him. Without knowing it, we are seeing each other for the last time. All of us, such as we are, have only the present moment for our own. The next belongs to God. There are always two chances of not seeing again the friend who is leaving us, our death and his. How many men have never reclimbed the staircase they have descended? Death touches us more before than after the decease of a friend. It is a piece of ourselves that is torn away, a world of childish recollections, of familiar intimacy, of affections and interests in common, that dissolves. My brother preceded me in my mother's womb. He was the first to dwell in those same sainted entrails whence I issued after him. He sat before me by the paternal hearth. He waited several years to welcome me, to give me my name in the name of Jesus Christ, and to ally himself with the whole of my youth. My blood, mingled with his blood, in the revolutionary receptacle, would have had the same savour, like a draught of milk, supplied by the pasturage of the same mountain. But, if men cause the head of my elder, my godfather, to fall before its time, the years will not spare mine. Already my forehead is shedding its covering. I feel an ugolino, time, stooping over me and gnawing at my skull. Come il pan perf a me si manduca. The doctor could not recover from his astonishment. He looked upon that which did not kill me, which came to none of its natural crises, as a phenomenon unprecedented in the history of medicine. Gangrene had set in my wound. They dressed it with quinine. Having obtained this first aid, I insisted on departing for Ostend. Brussels was hateful to me. I burned to leave it. It was once again filling with those heroes of domesticity who had returned from Verdun in their carriages, and whom I did not see in Brussels when I accompanied the king there during the hundred days. I travelled pleasantly to Ostend by the canals. I found some Bretons there, my comrades in arms. We chartered a deck barge and went down the channel. We slept in the hold on the shingle which served as ballast. The strength of my constitution was at last exhausted. I could no longer speak. The motion of a rough sea broke me down completely. I swallowed scarce a few drops of water and lemon, and, when the bad weather compelled us to put into Guernsey, they thought I was going to breathe my last. An emigrant priest read me the prayers for the dying. The captain, not wishing to have me die on board his ship, ordered me to be put down on the quay. They set me down in the sun, with my back leaning against a wall. 
and my head turned towards the open sea facing that isle of alderney where eight months before i had beheld death in another shape it would seem that i was vowed to pity the wife of an english pilot happened to pass by she was moved and called her husband who assisted by two or three sailors carried me into a fisherman's house me the friend of the waves they laid me on a comfortable bed between very white sheets the young bargewoman took every possible care of the stranger i owe her my life the next day i was taken on board again my hostess almost wept on taking leave of her patient women have a heaven-born instinct for misfortune my fair-haired and comely guardian who resembled a figure in the old english prince pressed my bloated and burning hands between her own so cool and long i was ashamed to touch anything so charming with anything so unseemly we set sail and reached the westernmost point of jersey one of my companions m du tillon went to st helier's to my uncle m de bedet sent a carriage to fetch me the next morning we drove across the entire island dying as i was i was charmed with its groves but i only talked nonsense about them having fallen into a delirium i lay four months between life and death my uncle his wife his son and his three daughters took it in turns to watch by my bedside i occupied an apartment in one of the houses which they were beginning to build along the harbour the windows of my room came down to the level of the floor and i was able to see the sea from my bed the doctor m de Latte, had forbidden them to talk to me of serious things and especially of politics towards the end of january seventeen ninety three seeing my uncle enter my room in deep mourning i trembled for i thought we had lost one of our family he informed me of the death of louis sixteenth i was not surprised i had foreseen it i asked for news of my relatives my sisters and my wife had returned to brittany after the september massacres they had had great difficulty in leaving paris my brother had gone back to france and was living at malesherbes i began to get up the smallpox was gone but i suffered with my chest and a weakness remained which i long retained jersey the caesarea of the itinerary of antoninus has remained subject to the crown of england since the death of robert duke of normandy we have often tried to capture it but always unsuccessfully the island is a remnant of our early history the saints coming to brittany armorica from hibernia and albion rested at jersey st helier a solitary dwelt in the rocks of caesarea he was butchered by the vandals in jersey one finds a specimen of the old normans it is as though one heard william the bastard speak or the author of the roman du roux the island is fertile it has two towns and twelve parishes it is covered with country houses and herds of cattle the ocean wind which seems to belie its rudeness gives jersey exquisite honey cream of extraordinary sweetness and butter deep yellow in colour and violet scented bernardin de st pierre conjectures that the apple came to us from jersey he is mistaken we have the apple in the pear from greece as we owe the peach to persia the lemon to media the plum to syria the cherry to sarassus the chestnut to castanea the quince to canea and the pomegranate to cyprus i took great pleasure in going out in the early days of may spring in jersey preserves all her youth she might still be called by her former name of primavera a name which as she grew older it left to her daughter the first flower with which it crowns itself here i will copy for you two pages from the life of the duc de berry it is as though i told him i am after twenty-two years of fighting the brazen barrier with which france was girt about was forced the hour of the restoration drew nigh our princes left their retreats each of them made for a different point of the frontier like travellers who at the risk of their lives seek to penetrate into a country of which marvels are related monsieur set out for switzerland monseigneur le duc d'angouleme for spain and his brother for jersey in that island in which some of the judges of charles i died unknown to their fellow-men monseigneur le duc de berry found french royalists grown old in exile and forgotten for their virtues as in former days the english regicides for their crime he met old priests henceforth consecrated to solitude he realized with them the fiction of the poet who makes a bourbon land on the island of jersey after a storm one of these confessors and martyrs might say to the ear of henry the fourth as the hermit of jersey said to that great king loin de la cour alors dans cette grotte obscure de ma religion je viens pleurer l'injure monseigneur le duc de berry spent some months in jersey the sea the winds politics bound him there everything opposed his impatience he found himself on the point of renouncing his enterprise and taking ship for bordeaux a letter from him to madame la maréchale moreau gives us a vivid idea of his occupations on his rock eighth february eighteen fourteen here i am like tantalus in sight of that unhappy france which finds so much difficulty in breaking its chains you whose soul is so beautiful so french can judge of my feelings how much it would cost me to move away from that shore which i should need but two hours to reach 
when the sun lights it i climb the tallest rocks and with my spy-glass in my hand i follow the whole coast i can see the rocks of coutances my imagination rises i see myself leaping on shore surrounded by frenchmen wearing the white cockade in their hats i hear the cry of long live the king that cry which no frenchman has ever heard with composure the loveliest woman of the province girds me with a white sash for love and glory always go together we march on cherbourg some rascally fort with a garrison of foreigners tries to defend itself we carry it by assault and a vessel puts out to fetch the king with the white ensign which recalls the days of france's glory and happiness ah madam when removed by but a few hours from so likely a dream can one think of betaking himself elsewhere it is three years since i wrote these pages in paris i had gone before monsieur le duc de berry in jersey the city of the exiled by twenty-two years i was to leave my name behind me since armand de chateaubriand was married and his son frederic born there gaiety had not abandoned the family of my uncle de Bede. my aunt continued to nurse a big dog descended from the one whose virtues i have related as it bit everybody and had the mange my cousins had it secretly hanged notwithstanding its nobility madame de Bede persuaded herself that some english officers charmed with azor's beauty had stolen it and that it was living laden with honours and dinners in the richest castle of the three kingdoms alas our present hilarity was compounded only out of our past gaiety by recalling the scenes at montchois we found means of laughter in jersey the case is rare enough for in the human heart pleasures do not keep up the same relations one to the other that sorrows do new joys do not restore their springtime to former joys but recent sorrows cause old sorrows to blossom over again for the rest the emigrants at that time excited general sympathy our cause appeared to be the cause of european order an honoured unhappiness such as ours is something m de bouillon was the protector of the french refugees in jersey he dissuaded me from my plan of crossing over to brittany unfit as i was to endure a life of caves and forests he advised me to go to england and there seek the opportunity of entering the regular service my uncle who was very ill provided with money began to feel straitened with his large family he had found himself obliged to send his son to london to feed himself on starvation and hope fearing lest i should be a burden to m de Bede, i decided to relieve him of my presence thirty louis which a saint malo smuggler brought me enabled me to put my plan into execution and i booked a berth on the packet for southampton i was deeply touched on bidding farewell to my uncle he had nursed me with the affection of a father with him were connected the few happy moments of my childhood he knew all i loved i found in his features a certain resemblance to my mother i had left that excellent mother and was never to see her again i had left my sister julie and my brother and was doomed to meet them no more i was leaving my uncle and his genial countenance was never again to gladden my eyes a few months had sufficed to bring all these losses for the death of our friends is not reckoned from the moment at which they die but from that at which we cease to live with them were it possible to say to time not so fast one would stop it at the hours of delight but as this is not possible let us not linger here below let us go away before witnessing the flight of friends and of those years which the poet considers alone worthy of life vita digno etas that which delights us in the age of friendships becomes an object of suffering and regret in the age of destitution we no longer desire the return of the smiling months to the earth we dread it rather the birds the flowers a fine evening at the end of april a fine night commencing in the evening with the first nightingale and ending in the morning with the first swallow those things which give the need and longing for happiness kill one you still feel their charms but they are no longer for you youth which tastes them by your side and which looks down upon you with scorn fills you with jealousy and makes you realize the completeness of your desolation the grace and freshness of nature while recalling your past happiness adds to the unsightliness of your misery you have become a mere blot upon that nature you spoil its harmony and its suavity by your presence by your words and even by the sentiments which you venture to express you may love but you can no longer be loved the vernal fountain has renewed its waters without restoring your youth to you and the sight of all that is born again of all that is happy reduces you to the sorrowful remembrances of your pleasures the packet on which i embarked was crowded with emigrant families I there made the acquaintance of Monsieur Angon, an old colleague of my brother's in the Parliament of Brittany, a man of taste and intelligence, of whom I shall have much to say. A naval officer was playing chess in the captain's room. He did not recollect my features, so greatly was I changed, but I recognised Gerriol. We had not met since Brest. We were destined to part at Southampton. I told him of my travels. He told me of his. 
This young man, born near me among the waves, embraced his first friend for the last time, in the midst of the waves which were about to witness his glorious death. Lambadoria, admiral of the Genoese, after beating the Venetian fleet, learnt that his son had been killed. Bury him in the sea, said this Roman father, as though he had said, bury him in his victory. Gerald voluntarily left the billows into which he had flung himself, only the better to show them his victory on shore. I gave the certificate of my landing from Jersey at Southampton, at the commencement of the sixth book of these memoirs. Behold me, therefore, after my travels in the forests of America and the camps of Germany, arriving as a poor emigrant in 1793, in the land in which I am writing all this in 1822, and in which I am living to-day, a splendid ambassador. End of part two of book seven.